Welcome to the MIT Social Entrepreneurship Alumni Group Zoom event, Failing to Win, Hard Learned Lessons from a Purpose-Driven Startup. I am Sayuri Sharper, president of the Social Al uh, Entrepreneurship Alumni Group, SEEK, and moderator of today's conversation. Joining me as a co-moderator is Vera Schroeder, SEEK's VP of Programming, and a partner at Safar Partners. Today, we welcome Mike Quinn, CEO of Boost and prior CEO of Zuna. Founded in 200, uh, uh, excuse me, 2009, Zuna is one of the first FinTech startups in Africa. During the 10 years while Mike was with Zuna, Zuna processed $2.5 billion worth of transactions for millions of previously, previously underserved consumers and earned 86 million in revenues. They raised more than 35 million in equity, debt, and grant capital. With the ambition of becoming a pan-African digital bank, Zuna kept raising larger investment rounds to chase a greater vision. This strategy, however, was Zoom's ultimate undoing. Curious about what happens and lessons he learned? Uh, we will hear from Mike shortly. Before we get there, I'd like to say a few words about our alumni group. Organized under MIT Alumni Association, our mission is to bring together MIT alumni and like-minded people to co-create a better world through social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Terminology is important. What do we mean by social entrepreneurship? Any organization that is addressing unmet social need or environmental problem through a market-driven approach. And impact events, investments are investments made with intent to contribute measurable positive social or environmental impact. If you're interested in social entrepreneurship or impact investing, I'd like to invite you to the C community. In addition to webinars, we also host other events to foster a community. One of those events is this Friday's Hangout. At 8 a.m., for those interested, and this is 8 a.m. Uh, West Coast time, We'll gather and reflect on Mike's journey, share our individual experiences and lessons learned. You will have to be a SEEK member to participate, to join. Please go to mitseek.mn.co. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mike. Hi, Mike, how are you? Hi, Sayuri. Hold on one second. I'm just organizing uh, myself. Um, so uh, when I first meet a social entrepreneur, I always like to start with the origin story. So can you tell us how you got started uh, in your journey? Yeah, th thank you so much for, um, for inviting me and, and for the opportunity and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I actually started writing this book, uh, Failing to Win, trying to answer that question because it was 2019. I had just left um, Zona after being there for 10 years and uh, trying to figure out how did I go from being a, uh, a normal, you know, uh, young Canadian. Um, I was the son of two high school teachers. I grew up in Calgary in, in Western Canada. And, um, and I never imagined in a million years I would uh, have a career like leading a a fintech in Zambia over a decade. And uh, the big turning point uh, that kind of led me on that path was when I was at uh, university, I was studying mechanical engineering in Vancouver at UBC. And I joined an organization that was a startup at the time called Engineers Without Borders. And um, I was really looking for like something to do that would be, that would have purpose. Cause I, I kind of had figured out I wasn't very technical even though I was like um, stuck studying engineering and, and doing math problems all the time. And uh, when I stumbled across EWB, they had this vision of uh, sending 
you know, young engineering graduates over to uh, emerging markets and, and, you know, working with partner organizations on long-term development projects. And uh, I knew nothing about Africa at the time. And I applied and uh, was sent to Ghana. Uh, this was back in 2003. And I had to look at where Ghana was on a map. Um, I li- like my knowledge of Africa was, was zero. And that just led me on this journey where I, I spent a year working on a, on a rural agriculture project. Um, then I did a second placement with them in Zambia. Um, and so this, like, I had this two and a half years of like, volunteer experience of two very different countries in Africa. Um, and I, I fell in love with the continent and I gained like, firsthand experience um, with poverty. Um, but I also saw like so much opportunity and uh, so many people just hustling and like all of these problems that I, I felt, you know, had solutions to them, um, you know, coming from a very uh, privileged background and, and where I grew up in Canada. And I went back to, uh, to university because I, I knew I couldn't be a volunteer for the rest of my life. And I, I kind of had more questions than I had answers. And I, I was figuring out that um, working like uh, uh, through just um, uh, aid-driven development projects, uh, you know, wasn't going to have the impact at scale that I, I thought it could and should, and um, got into a development studies master's program at the London School of Economics, and then um, I, I met my wife there, so that was uh, also a big turning point, and then um, the, the next big one was when I, I got into the Oxford Business School um, on a scholarship for social entrepreneurship, um, so this was back in 2007, uh, and that was just, I think, very lucky, um, to be honest, because I never, I, I, if I, if, if we fast forward like 10 years or, or where we are today, like I probably wouldn't have even got shortlisted for an interview. Um, but it was a time when uh, people were wondering, like, what is social entrepreneurship? Does it deserve to be in business school? And here I was um, as like the person who had volunteered for two years in Africa and I, I applied for the scholarship and I, I don't think they got many applications to be honest. Um, and uh, uh, I managed to, to get this um, full scholarship to go to Oxford. Um, and at that point, like I was becoming more and more aware of kind of the privilege I had. And I, I knew like I wanted to move back to Africa, start a business and do something that um, could just have as much impact as possible. Um, but I, I had no idea what. And um, through the course of my MBA, I started just like teasing out this idea around connecting impact investors um, that I, I was meeting through this, this network I was, I was building that were talking about investing in social entrepreneurs in Africa, but they didn't have enough deal flow. That was like the, the language people were using around there. There weren't enough like um, real opportunities or, you know, investors or entrepreneurs um, building scalable businesses. And I, I, I rejected that hypothesis. Hypothesis. I, I felt there was just so many entrepreneurs, but they weren't aware of where the capital was. There was just a huge disconnect with the people with money and the people who needed it. And um, I put my hand up and said, I can solve that problem. And um, there was a woman um, named Agnes Dowsiewicz, who is the chief investment officer at the Grassroots Business Fund that, that some people on the call may know. Um, and she was based in, in the U.S. in Washington. And I got introduced to her. Um, through a, a lecture in social enterprise um, at Oxford, who then um, uh, connected me. And then Agnes bought me a plane ticket to go back to Zambia to scout for deals for them. Um, and my very first day uh, there, I met these two brothers named Brad and Brett McGrath, um, who were starting a fintech business called Mobile Transactions um, that would later become Zona. And it's, it's, uh, Zona is like a Zambian word that means it's real. The Zambians would actually pronounce it like Zona. Um, and uh, these guys uh, were seeing what M-Pesa was doing in Kenya with mobile money and had the idea of like bringing it to Zambia. Um, but they were starting with rural payments in the agriculture sector. So they, they had already done a pilot with a cotton company um, trying to pay small scale farmers um, digitally into, uh, into mobile wallets. Um, back in 2009, this was pretty radical. Um, but uh, the challenge was nobody wanted digital payments. Uh, so the, the first few farmers they did this with, the, the, farmer, the first thing the farmer would say is, where do I get my cash? Um, and so then they pivoted into uh, trying to do person-to-person money transfers. And that was right when I joined. They, they had yet to launch that. So I, um, I, I helped them get the first uh, $200,000 investment from the Grassroots Business Fund. Um, saw them launch like the very first uh, agents and, uh, and set up a person-to-person money transfer network that I'm, I'm sure we can talk more about. 
Um, and then I went all in and convinced my parents uh, back in Canada who, who had just retired. Um, they had moved into a retirement house in Victoria and um, I had never made a risky investment in their whole life. Um, they didn't have uh, a lot of wealth um, other than their house. Um, but my mom said I made a pretty good sales pitch and she mortgaged her. And my dad went to the bank and, and took out a mortgage on their retirement home and lent me a hundred thousand um, dollars to put into the business. And um, yeah, I'd like to say the rest is history, but it was like <laughs> 10 years of ups and downs after that. Um, but that was kind of the origin story of how it all started. Wow. Uh, I, hats off to your parents. <laughs> That's awesome to have parents that, that would back you up like that. So when you started Zona, um, I, I, I kind of would like to understand what was your expectation then? And, and then how, what was kind of your combined vision uh, in terms of all the founders as to where Zona was gonna go? Yeah, um, such a great question. Um, Cause it, it just takes me back in time. So uh, when I met uh, these two brothers, Brad and Brett, um, I, I remember very vividly um, of like their reaction that first of all, like they'd never heard the term social enterprise or social entrepreneurship. Um, second of all, they had no concept that there would be investors overseas that would actually invest in them. It was just, um, it wasn't even on their radar. So I was almost like this, uh, this godsend where they're like, there's this Canadian guy with an Oxford MBA who just showed up who has an investment fund from the US that wants to invest in their business. Um, and it, like, it was just like the funniest reaction that they had where they're like, okay. Um, and then I, I managed to like as a partnership, like get some sweat equity for, for working with them to help the, the business so they didn't have to pay me a salary. Um, and then you know, a year later, I, I had, uh, I'd invested myself um, through my, my parents. Um, but uh, th at that time, like they had the vision of, um, of like this, Brad would say like this, a cashless Africa. He was the one who coined this phrase. Um, and he like already, they, they had uh, a couple businesses before that in the airtime industry. Um, so helping um, tele, you know, telecommunication companies or, or mobile network operators as, as they're called MNOs in Africa, um, sell uh, like very uh, incremental scratch cards, um, small value scratch cards to consumers. So. Um, the, the way the model worked in Africa is you'd have a consumer on the street that would buy like $1 worth of prepaid airtime. Actually, some of them were like down to like even like, you know, 25 cents um, in a scratch card that they would load into their phone and then they could talk for a few minutes or send some SMS messages. And, and their original technology allowed the, the telecommunications company in, in Malawi um, to then calculate the commissions paid to distributors and sub distributors. Um, and so they had this technology um, from a previous business, and then they saw the M-Pesa model, and they, they had that vision of a cashless Africa, so they thought really big. Um, they uh, shared a lot of the values with me, so they, you know, they wanted to make money. Um, they weren't doing it for the impact as, as really the motivation, which I was, because I, I was coming from this place of, like, I have so much privilege, and, and you know, I just was very, very aware of that, and I wanted to um, help connect people like them to, to funding and investment. Um, and then uh, they also, they had the expectation that they would like turn it into a cash flow positive business in a very short period of time and maybe get a bank to invest in them, to buy them and then scale it up across Africa. Um, and so the, I think the, the thing that I was able or the seed I was able to plant is that, well, we could attract international investment um, to stay in control of the company much larger or much longer and achieve like a much larger outcome. Um, and so I brought this concept around like, well, you know, we could turn this into a billion dollar company that scales everywhere. And um, I, I was a little bit audacious thinking that at the beginning, but I, I also had uh, a mentor um, named Patrick Pachette, who was uh, um, a, the chairman of Engineers Without Borders that I first volunteered with. And when I, when I met him um, there, he was like the, um, I think the COO of Bell Canada, this telecom in Canada. Uh, but then he got the job as the Google CFO. And he's currently the chair of Twitter. Um, and he invested in, in us in 2010 um, with like a small ticket. And so uh, we were a Zambian fintech startup, like with the Google CFO as an angel investor. And, and Patrick would always teach me um, like about just thinking big. And he said, you know, if you, if you set your sights on like um, 
building something that could affect a billion people, um, you know, maybe you'll never get there, but you'll get a lot farther than if you set your sights on building something that can get to like a million people, right? And um, just like kind of that power of like thinking big, because he was like living that world at Google all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, like initially people are like, this is just crazy talk and we're just doing this to raise money. But then people started buying into that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can tell more of the story as, as we get into some of the details, but yeah. it, it started to become something like, you know, five, six years later where people really believed in. And then we started seeing like this bigger opportunity that was emerging. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is a kind of audacious because uh, at that time you didn't have much uh, business or, or management experience, right? So yeah, by, by the way, I did uh, read your book. So I kind of know the, the story. So, so, you know, what did you feel like kind of stepping into this uh, role of the CEO and have to build a company? Yeah, yeah, she's, um, I, because I had no experience doing it, um, it was probably in my favor because I wasn't scared to do it. And I, I didn't, I didn't know how, but like, um, I, I had always been a very like independent, uh, very entrepreneurial person. Um, I, I have like, I'd never started a business before, but, um, you know, when I, I, I remember like as early back as like being a young kid and, I wanted to go, you know, skiing and I didn't have money and um, my parents wouldn't give me any. And so I would just like um, hustle and like um, mold people's lawns or when it snowed and like where I'm from, I'd like go shovel the like, people's driveways for like five dollars and get enough money. And then I'd be like, I'm going skiing for the weekend. And then I go, you know, use that to like rent equipment and pay for a bus. And so I, I was always like that. Um, and uh, uh, knowing, meeting Brad and Brett, I'm like, OK, these guys are are very experienced entrepreneurs, but, and I, I knew um, I could leverage off their experience and the companies that they had built before and the people they knew and, and they knew how to operate, but they also never built a company um, that really had like a lot of employees or took investment or, or had a board. So it was very much like a family partnership between two brothers um, with a, a, like a big audacious vision. Like they, they shared that, that drive. Um, and we very quickly just kind of rolled up our sleeves and got to work. Um, and uh, they, they made me the CEO initially um, uh, for just a very practical reason where they're like, okay, like Mike's the guy who can get us money um, because of where I came from and the networks I had. Um, and uh, it was like the worst executed um, succession plan probably in startup history because uh, Brad made me the CEO, but then he didn't tell his brother um, and, his, and, it, and it was like four months later where Brett was like, you know, when did Mike become the CEO? And we were like having an argument because um, so it was just like a, a title. But then eventually it became clear that like as brothers, they had, they struggled to make decisions. We had different strengths and weaknesses. And I, I kind of became the glue to help them, um, you know, focus on what they were really good at. And Brett, it was building the technology and the business processes. And Brad, it was like the sales and kind of commercial operations. Um and uh, I'd love to say it was smooth um, and we just figured it out, but um, it was like years and years of, of um, trial by fire, constantly failing. Um, and I, I learned a lot about this, like actually writing the book. And so initially when I, when I left, um, you know, fast forward, I like, I'm like, I failed to win, right? We didn't get the exit. We didn't achieve the vision that we set out to. Um, and I was writing as a reflection and, and like a healing process. And then I started realizing, I was like thinking of these questions um, about like how we eventually figured all of these things out, but it, it was just like, we failed so much in order to figure it out. So it was like failing in order to win. Um, and, uh, you know, a few years later, um, we had uh, got to the point where we had like clear definition of roles. Um, we understood each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we understood each other's personalities. Um, we figured out, like when we brought in a fourth partner, Keith Davies is our CFO, um, and uh, stopped like um, uh, stepping on each other's toes so much, um, stopped fighting over making decisions. Uh, we got much more aligned. And, and I, I grew up so much in that process because I learned that my job as the CEO and then the, the leader ultimately wasn't about just the doing. That was like the biggest leap I had to make. Um, and it wasn't even about like a vision. Initially, I actually tried to like manage them. Um, and that was a total failure because you can't really manage entrepreneurs and, and founders and especially brothers that are like years older than you. 
Um, so it was really around like the, the soft leadership skills of like aligning people, making sure everybody's like um, very clear in, in roles and responsibilities, communicating well, um, overcoming conflict, dealing with decisions. And uh, once we got our, our Series A investment from uh, Omidyar Network and Axion back in, in 2012, um, I, I had a huge amount of benefit, um, particularly from Omidyar Network, um, because they, they had a human capital um, technical assistance team that was like people from PayPal and eBay, and they provided all of this coaching to, uh, um, to their portfolio company. So um, I had kind of figured it out on my own, like figured some of it out on my own. I, I was getting it wrong more often than not. Um, but then I started getting professional help, right? And I also had Patrick Bichette as a coach um, that I, I got a little bit of his time each quarter talking about just some of the, the scaling challenges we're having and strategy and, and, and people management. Um, and, um, that accelerated me greatly. Like I, I, without that, like mentorship and coaching from, uh, people that were a few steps ahead of me, um, it would have, it would have probably been impossible, like, you know, to do what we did. Um, but we, we eventually figured it out. And, and now that I'm, I'm doing it again, I'm realizing how like my second company now boost, um, uh, we've probably fast forwarded the first five years of what we, what I learned at Zona. Right, yeah. it really was like that much of a, an accelerant. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a, a yeah, uh, learning on the job. But I, I guess that's the way to actually learn a new skill set. Uh, so, in, in terms of your kind of early growth uh, phase, so what do you what did you do right uh, to? to set up the foundation to get to a point where you can uh, raise series A and series B and, uh, and get your growth going? Yeah, the, um, so the, the thing that we did, uh, like the, by far the best thing we did at the early phases of, of Zona was um, we, we really zoomed in on, on our customer and our customer experience and we, we kind of, as the founders, um, like lived that every day. So we were, um, the, I'll just kind of take a half step back and explain the model is um, <clears throat> we set up um, these young entrepreneurs as agents and by young people straight out of high school, um, we would give them a, a phone, they would sit in a kiosk, we provided a digital uh, loan to them and then they could do cash in, cash out transactions um, out of their kiosk for consumers who needed to send and receive money. And at that time, the majority of people didn't have bank accounts. There was no mobile money in the market. And so that, um, that problem of moving money from point A to point B for school fees, for somebody who had a health emergency that you needed to pay for a hospital bill or medicine, a small business paying for their stock from their supplier. Like this was a, a huge problem that everybody faced in their life and didn't have a, a solution to other than moving cash around. Um, and people would just like literally take taxis or buses to, to move cash from point A to point B, or they would pay somebody that they trusted to do that. Um, so to, to move money through our agent network was, was a pretty um, major disruption in the market that um, saved a lot of people time and brought a big uh, amount of convenience moving money around. And um, the, the challenge uh, to get this up and running was, well, uh, how do we um, set up the first agents um, so that you could have like an agent where there's somebody sending a money transfer and an agent where somebody is receiving a money transfer. Um, and then how do we let consumers know that this service even exists? And we didn't have a lot of money or a well-defined brand. Um, and even the first investment we got, we, we, you know, we spent it on just a lot of stupid things initially and experiments because we were, we like didn't have a clear strategy. And, um, but what, what kind of stuck was uh, when we were almost, we were agents like ourselves. And like the first agents we set up, um, people would sign up to be agents, but then they would never um, provide the service to customers. So a customer would come and they would see the sign that says send money here, but then the agent would say, oh, I, you know, I don't know how to do it, or I don't have enough floats to do the transaction. And uh, it, it just was a lot of time spent in the field of doing it ourselves and like trying to walk in our customer's shoes. And like, you know, literally to the point of like Brad and I, in, in Zambia um, as agents with phones, serving the customers, trying to convince people, um, hey, do you need to send money? Um, and, and we set up a first agent right next to a post office that people would use to send money. So 
we, we found like where customers were initially going. Um, we then would like pull them into our kiosk. We do the money transfer ourselves for them. Um, we'd be on the phone with Brett who was in Cape Town building the technology to like tell them how the experience was, ask people where the where they were sending money to. And then we put somebody on a bus to that location to set up another agent. Um, and it was, it was not scalable at all. It was very manual. Um, but to get the business going, it, it definitely worked. And we, we just learned, you know, a lot around um, doing it ourselves and, and just living that experience. And um, that um, actually stayed part of our culture all the way through, like, you know, at, at, at scale, we were doing like a million dollars a day in like money transfers, right? It was, it was a big, big operation. A quarter of the adult population in Zambia was using us. And uh, we built like very good relationships with all of our, our best agents because, you um, we um, like outsourced the problem because we couldn't do it ourselves all the time. So then we're like, well, how do we fit, find somebody to do this? What's our value proposition to them in terms of how much money they need to make and how do we make that experience for the agent as good as possible? And then um, we always had like a WhatsApp group with our top agents so that um, we could get like real time feedback of what was happening. And you know, if the system was down or if, uh, if we didn't have an agent in a certain location. Um, so I, I think we, uh, we really got that right. Um, we failed a lot on how to systematize it. So there was a lot of scaling challenges, but um, we, we knew our customers very well. So before I continue on uh, our one-on-one -on -one discussion, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, uh, this is your session. So the Q&A are open to you uh, and you don't have to wait until uh, Mike and I stop our discussion. Uh, whenever you have a uh, question, please put it into the Q&A and we will get to that uh, in probably another uh, 10 minutes so that uh, you can ask Mike all these questions uh, besides, besides me. Uh, so uh, yeah, get ready to ask some questions. That is, uh, is such a great start. I, I think that uh, really understanding your customer, and in this case, it's not just your customer because the agents are your source and really knowing uh, you know, what it's like for them and finding the success uh, in working with them, that, that's, that's a really good lesson. Now, so that was your start and you started uh, getting more and more successful with that model. Then, um, then you're in more of this growth uh, phase. So uh, can you talk about some maybe common pitfalls that uh, a startup company can face uh, when you go to the growth phase, especially in your case, it's a pretty fast paced growth uh, through the, uh, the company. Yes. Um, so I think the most common one, because uh, I know all, all the founders I've like been involved with or mentored or coached also experienced it. And we, we went through this was um, the like Steve Jobs called it the Bozo explosion, but it's really like the, the scaling up of like your headcount. And this is especially after you get money, because when you're you're small and you're you're, you're like at the founders, you're always in the field with your customers and you don't know when your next paycheck is going to come and you're, you're kind of like scrappy and hustling. And it, as soon as you're lucky enough to get some investment, now you've got money in the bank and now you have to hire people and you have to manage people. And then as you, you scale, like those people you hire, then hire other people. Um, and um, oftentimes, like when you, you don't, don't have that experience, you, uh, you make a lot of mistakes. Um, and uh, one of the ones that like, I think we definitely made was we hired um, too quickly and ahead of the curve. Um, and, and we were almost at the time, like high-fiving each other when we'd come into the office and we'd be like, there's people here. We don't know. They're like, we were hiring so quickly that we forgot we, that we didn't know people's names. Um, and at the time it was like almost uh, uh, like um, we felt like we were scaling and that was success, but really it should have been a big warning sign and like a big red flag that we were, we were losing control of the, the culture. Um, and uh, we thought we needed to get higher ahead of the curve because we had like this Silicon Valley like mindset around just like blitz scaling and, and we need all these people, but it created so many knock on effects um, of uh, not like not having clear roles and responsibilities, not having our, our culture um, well-defined and codified. So we, we didn't know who was a fit and who wasn't a fit. Um, 
we had like obviously a big increase in headcount, and um, and these like were, like were all internal challenges. So externally, um, it, it was almost it, it made the problem worse. Where everybody knew we were we were growing, and like they saw us hiring all these people. So I'd go to like have coffee or I'd go to events and people would be like, Zona's doing so well, right? You guys are just like, you're scaling so quickly. And internally there's like politics and infighting and, um, and it, it took us a long time to, I think, figure that out. And like a lot of pain of, of reaching a point where we had to then restructure and let people go. And that was a bit of a cycle that we, we did a few times. Um, and it was almost the worst after every funding round because Every time we, we did a funding round, we felt like we had learned the lessons from the past funding round and you need to hire, right? You can't grow unless you hire. Um, but uh, it, it was just, um, I, I probably learned the most around hiring, recruiting, onboarding, um, like building culture. And, and now where I've, I've come out the other side of that is a principle that I like would offer to any founders of build uh, your team with the fewest right people um, so really challenge yourself around how small can we get and, and how small can we stay in terms of headcount? Because not only that does that have like a direct cost um, savings, but it, it means that you have fewer people to get aligned. You can move a lot faster. You find much more creative solutions around like, can we automate this process? Can we um, improve our product or add a feature um, to scale a little bit more quickly um, without just like adding more and more people? And then making sure that like the people you do have are like the right ones of just like investing the time up front to be very, very selective. And once you do hire somebody, you know that um, uh, you, you don't know whether they're the right, for, the right person for about six months. Um, that's kind of my general rule. Um, so instead of, hey, we've gone through a good interview and, and this is the person we're going to back. It's now, now saying, well, let's onboard and let's evaluate and make sure that it's a good fit both sides. Um, that, that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned. And, um, and, and then you can get off this hamster wheel of spending all your time as a CEO fundraising. And then as soon as you get the money, hiring everybody and then realizing that you need to downsize because you've like overhired and then you need to raise money again. And, and I think I have spent way too much of my personal time and energy doing that over the last decade. And I, I'm trying not to do it again this time. So, so let's talk about fundraising because that <laughs> is a... Uh, 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 big part of uh, a CEO's job in these type of startups. Uh, so how, how was your experience and, and kind of lesson learned through your experience in, in fundraising? Yeah, um, again, such a good good question. And it's, it's so different now than it was then. <clears throat> um, in some ways, <clears throat> excuse me, in some ways it was easier um, when we were like one of the only startups um, and uh, like Zona was uh, like uh, uh, like pioneering, but there was Pega in Nigeria. And I remember Omidyar Network invested in us and then Pega in 2012. Um, and, uh, and when we were look looking for investors at that time, there was like five people to go to. Um, so th there wasn't really much of a sorting problem. Um, there, uh, I, I actually remember talking to a, an investor as well, an African investor who told me, like, stop talking about this Series A thing. Like, that doesn't exist in Africa. This is an American thing, right? Like, um, like there's no series of rounds of investments of Series A and Series B. Um, and so uh, we were learning as we were going, but it was, it was kind of, we were the early adopters. And then we were talking to investors who, like, wanted to invest in Africa. And it was just an easy matchmaking process. Um, and uh, then as we scaled, um, we, we learned that like as, as the numbers were, were good, like if the results are good, um, the investment is easy. And it, it creates a, a false, false sense of that the money will always be there. Um, and in the later stages, uh, we, we, that got us into a lot of trouble because um, we went through some, some serious challenges of like there was a currency crisis and we raised the big Series B and then we had a failed market expansion into Mozambique. Um, and then when we needed to raise money again, it was like way harder because the, the narrative was harder and there was a gap in the market where there wasn't a lot of growth capital um, and the old formula no longer worked. Um, so, so that was like a, a big lesson learned around, um, uh, you know, trying to, to, to not um, build a business just for investors and make sure you're, you know, you're always, um, uh, you know, like over promise, or under-promising, over-delivering, 
um, trying to like keep expectations in check um, and, uh, and being aware that like the, um, the mindset or, of investors can shift very quickly, like from like you're the, the hot company and this is the hot market to um, your yesterday's news, right? And I, I've kind of gone through that cycle. Um, the, the, also today, like fundraising in, in today's climate is so different because there are so many startups, there are so many investors and it, it's a bit of a different challenge of how do you like punch above your weight and like stand out and differentiate. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, also, um, it seems like in, in Africa today, like if you go through Y Combinator, you're almost guaranteed to get funding. Um, but I think there's a, a, a different challenge where some companies get funding too quickly, too much funding too quickly at too high a valuation, um, which increases your expectations very early on. And then you, you probably make a lot of decisions um, that may be suboptimal. Whereas if you're, if you're um, bootstrapping a little bit longer or you have like a lower valuation to start, um, you, you can stay in control of your journey a little bit longer. Um, this is like a, it's, I'm, I haven't found the science to fundraising. I feel it's like, there's a lot of art to this. And yeah. I, I feel like I learn something new every day. So yeah. even though people look at me and they're like, Mike, you've been doing this, like you've nailed this. Like I actually feel like um, it's always changing and it's just like yeah. a something to discover. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, interesting advice because uh, I think a lot of uh, startup uh, founders and uh, CEOs think that you know getting that big valuation uh, is what they they really need to go for, and and in fact, Mike, your advice is to to be cautious uh, and that the the level of valuation and expectation that uh, you set with an uh, investor can kind of dramatically change kind of what type of strategy that you can pursue and and I think that 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 is a, a, a really good lesson for a lot of folks to to learn and, and so besides rate of fundraising the other question I think that's uh, to me is really interesting is uh, ro road advisors and boards um, so what do you think about getting kind of whether it's formal or informal advisors when you're uh, smaller and when is the right time to set up a, a company board? Yeah, um, so uh, <clears throat> I would get advisors immediately and I would um, delay setting up a board um, probably as long as possible. Um, but I, let me put some nuance around those two answers because I, I think there's a lot of devils in the details. So. Um, advisors can be like so instrumental to your your growth as like a leader or a founder or CEO, um, somebody who is like walked in your shoes, who can understand um, the journey and, and help you avoid like common scaling pitfalls. Um, so for me, I had uh, just an incredible mentor of Patrick Bichette, and I learned so much from him. Um, and I, I recognize how how like lucky I was because like most people don't have like a Google executive right as a as a mentor. Um, um, but I, I also learned uh, from him and, and from others, like what you can get from mentors. So from Patrick, it was really around like leadership, um, but he, he didn't know anything about like our market, right? Or our model, right? So um, there were other people that I learned from uh, for that. So one, one of our investors, um, like I can maybe just uh, signal at Arjun Acosta, who is um, a partner and in our, our investor at Omidyar Network, um, who had like worked across um, emerging markets, had worked in Africa much of his career, knew like um, financial services extremely well, um, knew the landscape very well. So like I learned a lot about like business models and strategy from him, um, <clears throat> whereas uh, like he hadn't built a company. So I, I could learn that more from Patrick. Um, so, so having advisors that can um, give you different types of, val of, of value and having almost like as, as a leader, like a personal uh, board of directors, I would like re recommend when you think of like, who is the person like when I need, like I, I have a weak spot or blind spot on marketing and I want somebody who's like amazing at marketing and uh, somebody who's amazing at people management, somebody who, who for fundraising can just open up like networks and knows all the investors. So like understand your own strengths and weaknesses and then like build this personal board of directors um, that can be advisors to you and ideally the company. And, and if they can invest money in the company, like that's the best because then their incentives are aligned and they, they want to contribute to uh, the success. Um, <clears throat> the, the formal board is a little bit different because 
Um, I, I wrote about this in the book around how um, when we closed our Series A, the way we set up our, our formal board just had flawed logic from the beginning because it was it was based on like this governance of around like control where we had two lead investors and so each of them naturally are like well we have a policy that we need to take a board seat and then we had the two brothers who were the original founders who were like well we're taking a board seat and then i was the ceo um and um i was kind of stuck in the middle because the, the founders saw me as aligned to the founder or saw, actually saw me as wanting to be on their side and the investors were scared that like they would be outvoted um so then we we kind of got to the situation where well we need an odd number of board members and then we had like a seven person board <clears throat> and then we had an, a, a passive investor that they wanted an observer seat and so i was a first time ceo and i went into a board meeting where we had like it was literally like eight people plus our lawyer and then keith our cfo was like wanted to be in the room um and that just created a huge amount of governance and like overhead on the company um and it, it ended up being um not value adding for a long time because there was just like update meetings and reporting like what management was doing um to like investors <laughs> and eventually the company caught up to the to the stage where that we did figure it out and the board became like a big strategic asset but um if i could go back in time um, I would have structured it as like probably a three person board um, so that the governance is very light and you have like maybe one founder, one investor um, <clears throat> and uh, maybe one independent, somebody who's like invested in the company or, or is like key to, to its growth. Um, so like the actual formal section of the, the board of directors is, is like really lean. Um, but then you have this broader advisory network that you can pull from and the advisors often don't need to get involved in like the formal parts and they might not even want the liability of being in the, like on the board of directors. Um, so I, I do think you can kind of get to a happy medium that way of good advisors, but then um, a small board and, and making sure you don't have it until it's needed. This is such an interesting discussion. So I can just take up the whole rest of the time. So I'll, I'll, I'll try not to do that. So I'll ask the last question and, and open it up to everybody else. So um, tell me about uh, kind of, I, I guess, uh, uh, when you resign and how you felt and your motivation to come back and start another startup and, and do this journey again. Yeah, so um, uh, when I when I resigned, um, uh, so that like the, the circumstances very briefly are we had had a, a $40 million Series C investment round collapse, um, <clears throat> uh, much of it due, due to reasons outside of our control with the, the investor. Um, we got attacked by two uh, telcos um, that spent a lot of money going after our market share. And um, and we actually, with the money in the bank, we could have had a good shot at, at competing against them. But without the money, um, even if you have the best business with the best brand and product and team and culture, it's really hard to compete, um, as, especially at that level. Um, we couldn't even cut our prices because we, we had no money to fund it. Um, and so uh, I, I had to leave. Um, and, de you know, definitely cut the, the journey short, but I was very proud that like we, we went through a severe restructuring, we saved the business. Um, uh, my original co-founders, Brad and Brett, uh, took over. Brad stayed on for another year and then he stepped away and, and Brett has, has managed to um, uh, spin out a new fintech startup out of the, like as a phoenix rising out of the ashes. So uh, we, we stayed very close as well and, and man managed to have very good relationships through that process. Um, but I, I definitely felt like a failure and I, you know, I started writing this as a, a, a reflection and a, almost a therapy process of, uh, um, you know, what happened and how did we get to these, to this outcome that like none of us really wanted to get to. Um, and that's when I really realized like how much success we actually had and, um, and how, um, how much uh, of the success was due to previous failures. And I was thinking of like, what do I do next and how do I, or uh, how might I um, really internalize the lesson, lessons learned and then design a new company um, to, to build on that. So like the failing at Zona became, uh, becomes the, the platform for like future success. And I, I read uh, Phil Knight's Shoe Dog during this process as well too. And great book, like the, the Nike founder. 
Um, and 70% of that book, if not more, is about um, Blue Ribbon, which is the company I'd never heard of, um, but it was the company that preceded Nike. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like he almost uh, went out of business for a decade over and over and over again. Um, so my new company, Boost, was like, well, what if I could do this all over again with what I learned, um, with where the market is now? And um, I, I knew I wanted to start another company. That was like the, the day I left Zona, I was already pitching. I, I, I actually remember meeting Arjuna, my investor for coffee. And I'm like, here's what I'm going to do next. <laughs> and he's just like, Mike, take a break, please, please, please. And, and other people told me that as well. And I, I kind of took a little bit of a break. Um, and then I was writing was my reflection, but already I was like, here's what I'm going to do. And here's, here's like the first deck. And, um, um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a healing process. And by the time the book was done, I was ready to go again. I, I felt better. And I'm like, I knew exactly how to do it. So well, it, that's a, a total sign of a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you just can't help yourself. Uh, but uh, it, it's great. Um, let me introduce Vera, who is my co-host. And Vera will help us uh, get questions from the audience. Vera. Hi, all. Um, good to meet you online, Mike. Uh, thank you for the for the interest of Yuri. So I will help with reading out questions um, that our audience has submitted in the Q&A box. So the first one, um, which I think is a very interesting one, is coming from Dan Block. Mike, he asks, given that Zona didn't achieve an exit, do you have any regrets about pushing the brothers to think bigger and taking them away from achieving a more measurable return? How should entrepreneurs decide whether to go big versus managing the steady and profitable growth? Yeah, um, it's such a good question um, that I thought long and hard about. And um, so uh, the first point, like I have no regrets because um, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, like you, I have failures and things I would have done differently, but, uh, but no regrets. Um, the vision for from like both my co-founders from the very beginning was a cashless Africa, right? So we already were, were like thinking big and we were very aligned around that. And um, what we could have done differently is I think our path of how to get there. Um, and, uh, and just like, it didn't need to be um, the, the strategy we did. Like we, we didn't, I think weren't realistic enough with like that we were a small market, the, the, the funding realities at the time, <laughs> the, the kind of experience that we had and like some of the ways that manifested was like how we, we tried to go into new markets super quickly without like really thinking through about this. Um, we, we were hiring like, you know, as I mentioned, too far ahead of the curve. We neglected um, our core at times that we should have doubled down and, and invested and like didn't get the sequencing right. Um, and, uh, and I also think even in terms of exit, uh, there were possibilities that we could have considered around um, like, for example, exiting our, our Zambia uh, uh, business um, and not our technology business, because we, we knew that we wanted this, this vision of a cashless Africa, um, but we could have recognized like, you know, six years in that, um, hey, the Zambia business is like taking off and like maybe we can get an exit there that like fills our coffers to then um, launch like a, a new platform or a, a new strategy um, as opposed to just like taking the original one and continuing to double down on it. Um, but I say all this, and, and some, some of you may have seen that Wave Money, um, which is a, a business in Senegal that really took the inspiration from Zona's business model, applied it in, in a similar size market in Senegal, um, got a $200 million investment for a $1.7 billion valuation a couple weeks ago. Um, and that, that shows like timing is like really important <laughs> as well too. Right, and uh, um, if 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 we were in today's funding climate, um, you know, it, Zona had at its peak two million active customers and and twenty five percent of the adult population using us. Right, so uh, so we we kind of had our our. You know, I, I don't I don't have regrets, but I, I think there were things that we could have done that would have got to a different outcome. But um, we're all very comfortable with where we are. Like, you know, I think we we learned a lot in the process. Yeah. yeah. Very good, thank you. Um, so the next question comes from um, PK, who asks, in your opinion, what startup lessons slash wisdoms from Silicon Valley didn't apply in Zambia? In general, what aspects of building and growing startups are culture specific? Love the question. 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, like, definitely hiring ahead of the curve, <laughs> without without a doubt. Um, that one, uh, uh, and even things around um, like stock options, uh, right? Because we were we were one of the like, the first companies to give like possibly even the first company to give stock options to all of our employees, and uh, we even gave some to our agents. But um, they these were things like that had no value to most people. Um, and I, I don't regret doing it because I think it, it kind of created a, a, an ownership culture, um, but it was hard doing it the first time um, because people are like, what, what are these things? What do they mean? Like, I just want, I want health insurance right? or medical insurance. I don't want like stock options. Um, so that, that was one that was challenging. Um, I, I think probably the biggest one was um, uh, like the growth at all costs um, kind of philosophy that you, you just raised to get your, to your next round. Um, and the valuation needs to keep going up and up and up. And, um, and that like, that's becoming more feasible now. Like there's companies that are executing on that today that like are, are going to become unicorns and, and they are already. Um, right. So I think there is a path to do that. But when I, when I thought or go back in time, um, like, especially when we were raising our series B and then thinking of like, you know, that, that real growth capital, um, there were, we were in that like growth at all costs, like mindset um, without thinking through like, Hey, the next round of money might not actually be there um, because we had to make a jump from a venture capital world to a private equity world that people, investors would value businesses based on um, profit multiples and discounted cash flows. And um, that's why I think our series C, one of the reasons why it failed because there wasn't um, a pool of capital that, was ready to like take a Zambian company and turn it into a Pan-African digital bank. Um, and we, we thought that there was, right. That's why we kept raising and we're like, Oh, somebody will fund this. And like, let's keep growing and focusing on future growth. Um, where one of the things we could have done is say like, you know what, we need to like, just get profitable, um, you know, and, uh, and get in control of our business. And then, then we can, you know, you can still build the company and maybe that we can get a, a bigger investor, some point in the future, but we know we, we got ourselves in a position where that was the only route we had, right. To get that, that, that bigger investor. And I, I think that was the Silicon Valley mentality that, um, you know, ho- ho- it, it may apply. Like, like I said, like I companies today will, will pull that off. I have no doubts, but um, we, we tried and we didn't. <laughs> um, thank you. That was, that was a very helpful answer. And then um, Dan Block is asking, given that VC funding in Africa is still disproportionately going to expat led companies, how do you manage your desire as an expat, expat sorry, yeah. of, of first being a catalyst for impact on investing in Africa with second, the shifting investment landscape focused on highlighting and backing more African founders? I love this question. Thank you for that. Um, it's such an important topic, um, a very near and dear to my heart. And it was like, if I go back to why I actually moved to Zambia and started this business in the first place, it was actually because I believed that there was this capital that didn't like founders that didn't have access to the capital where it was. And I, I wanted to be the conduit to that. Um, and uh, I like, that was it worked. It was successful the first time. And as I've, I've set up my new company boost, um, I, I've actually taken on this exact challenge because um, the way I've, I've kind of, I've structured it is I spend uh, most of my time fundraising. Um, and then I've, I've set up uh, co-founders. Um, I haven't set them up. I've, I've like found co-founders in different markets um, that I can channel the capital to so that they don't have to spend uh, 50% of their time running around and fundraising um, because I, this is, it's such a problem, right? It, it's like, it takes way longer. It's way harder than anybody thinks and imagines. And I, I know firsthand how hard this is for me. And I'm like the white Canadian male with like the Oxford MBA, right? And I, it's like, I get rejected all the time. I fail at fundraising all the time. And I can only imagine the challenge of like, if you're a founder in Uganda, if you're like a woman, um, if you're just starting your business and even knowing where to start and having access to that network. Um, so, so my, you know, my approach to this, Dan, is, is just like to kind of um, recognize the privilege that goes with that and try to like be part of the solution. Um, what I, I hope is that 
more money flows into Africa, um, more investors um, spend more time like getting on the ground, understanding the market and, um, and just like finding the entrepreneurs there so that it's not, it's not about where the founders live um, or who the founders know, um, which right now it still very much is. Like there's, there's a reality that like um, people, if, if you live in San Francisco and you, um, as a founder in San Francisco, you can get money a lot easier at a lot harder, higher valuation um, for an African business that you don't run, right? That's like a reality today. Um, and I, I think we have a long way to go before we like properly fill that gap. But um, I, I'm glad that there's more awareness around it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any advice on the oh sorry Yuri, go ahead yeah uh, like i think that there is starting to be more and more awareness and more and more funds that are local funds rather than all international funds so um that points to in, in my opinion a better path but but certainly it's not there. We're just at the start of uh, folks uh, fo more focused on on funding uh, local social entrepreneurs. But Vera, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we only have five minutes left. So oh. one question. Uh, and Vera, you can uh, pick a question to answer or you can post one that you're really curious uh, about before we wrap this up. I'll ask a question that, that I had as you were talking. Um, you mentioned that as you were growing and hiring rapidly and you had this coffee meeting where someone said, oh, you must be doing great because you're um, hiring so rapidly and it made you a little uneasy or it wasn't really in line of, well, does that really mean it's going great? No. So I think like from your perspective, what are some of the internal indicators where you as a founder really can say, hey, we're like, we're doing well, we are in a good place. Yeah, uh, great question. And I think it, it, it comes back from your, it has to start with your customers. And I'll, I'll just tell a brief story around this, um, which was like very similar to what you were saying, where we had closed our Series B, we had lots of money in the bank. Um, and I was so disconnected from our agents, the original people I used to spend all my time with because I had layers of management. And I'm like, I never spent any time in the field anymore with customers. And even when I go into market, I'm in meetings all the time. So um, I took a month off and I, I like took a month off where I said, no, I'm not going to be in any meetings and I'm just going to do a customer immersion trip where I went to cross Zambia and Malawi and spent a hundred percent of my time with our agents where I would work with them in the day, like sitting in the kiosk doing money transfers. And at night I would, uh, I would have dinner and I'd sleep in their houses, um, like often on the floor with like a little mat. It was like a kind of camping um, just getting to know who they were as people. And uh, I, I felt like I needed to do this for myself. Um, I went back to my roots as like a volunteer and I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I was living in Cape Town at the time. Um, and I'm like, I'm just totally out of touch. And then what I realized through that was, first of all, the, um, the energy it brought back to me. Second, the insights I gained from that experience that then translated back into like, all the feedback and challenges and problems and things our customer experience wasn't delivering on that we were really easy, quickly able to fix. Um, and then third, the motivation that um, went back to our, our team. Um, and and uh, we had created like some little videos around this and like people, like our technology developers were just like, this is why I wanna work for this company because I wanna solve problems for our customers. Um, and so that that's how I, uh, like a lesson I learned now, it's like, it doesn't matter about your LinkedIn posts or your latest funding milestones or even your valuation, right? Like this is kind of a, it's, it's a metric that's obviously important for lots of reasons, but um, what matters at the end of the day are, are you delivering for your, your customers and um, internally, you know that, like, if you don't know, that's go find out. And then once you find out, you'll know pretty quickly, like how you're doing, like, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Oh, we're almost at the top yeah. of the hour. So Yuri, do you want to send us off? Yeah, um, but one question that, that was intriguing that I saw that we couldn't answer, is, but it's a short question, so uh, I'll ask you. Mike, did you pay your parents back? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, I did. I, I, uh, I, I, like, I was very lucky that my, uh, my wife had a job, um, and uh, so we were able to live off her salary and I, I channeled mine back until my parents uh, got 100% of their money back. 
And when I set up this, um, and uh, I was I was just getting going again. COVID started. I was in lockdown. I had no money. Um, and my parents actually uh, lent me some more to get Boost off the ground. So um, oh, wow. they're, they're two time investors in my businesses. Oh, um, wow. But uh, hey, one thing I know just I don't want to forget before I leave. Um, so for anybody uh, who's interested in failing to win, it's available on Amazon, um, Kobo, Nook, um, paperback, uh, audiobook, where I narrated, and also ebook. And um, I self publish, so just really appreciate. Um, all the support and uh, you know word of mouth through LinkedIn posts or Amazon reviews. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike, for coming. And just a reminder, quick reminder that we'll have our our Friday um, uh, get together uh, to to talk about what we learned from the session with Mike. So for those of you that are interested, just go to the SEED website and sign up for the event. Again, uh, this was great. And I do encourage everybody to read your book. Uh, I think you. that's it for today. Bye, everybody. Thanks all for coming, asking your questions. All right, thank you. Bye.